Generally, around one third of our incoming community college students are deemed underprepared for the reading and writing demands of college level courses. Yet reading is something students must do for every class and teaching reading should be a shared responsibility among all faculty, from general education courses to discipline courses. You don't have to be an expert in teaching reading to help students develop and continue practicing the needed reading skills for college. Even taking 10 minutes to embed reading strategies into a single class session can help address the reading deficits we see. Additionally, it's important to model for students how scholars in your discipline approach the reading process. This presentation will view that and more, so let's start talking about teaching reading strategies in the content areas. What you'll see in this video is the three stages of the reading process. We'll also explore how students can use pre-reading strategies to engage with the text, and we will review a very specific method for annotation that enhances students' recall and retention of information. The reading process can be divided into three stages, and this is important to highlight for students as they often only see reading as a single step or a single process. But in fact, students should practice the pre-reading stage, the active reading stage, and the post-reading stage. Pre-reading is what readers can do before they really even dive into a text to help them activate prior knowledge, stimulate interest in a topic, identify purposes and goals for reading, and to provide language preparation. This presentation will focus specifically on a strategy to help students stimulate interest in a topic, helping them want to read the assigned text. Active reading is what we are most familiar with, annotation, and annotations can help students build knowledge within the context for reading to self-monitor their comprehension and to make the information more memorable for recall. Post-reading is another very important part of the reading process, although this presentation won't talk much about it, but this is what students can do after finishing a reading to enhance their understanding and enable long-term retention. Pre-reading. There are many types of pre-reading strategies from predicting, questioning, skimming, um, visualizing, and so much more. Today, we're going to look at how questioning can be used to stimulate interest in a text. This involves a student asking who, what, when, where, why, and how questions. And what I love about this strategy is that it takes less than five minutes of class time. Let's look at an example. Here's an article I've used in class to model this process for students. I'm going to show you a few screenshots of sections of the article, but the article is called, I went from prison to professor. And what I would have my students do with me is skim from beginning to end, just to make observations about the text. So what you can see here on the first page is the title and there's an image, and then there's some short paragraphs. If you continue to skim, you'll notice that there are headings in this particular article, and each heading is fairly short, um, short paragraphs, but even just as a quick skim, you can see there might be some factual information in there um, that relates to the topic. And then one more screenshot of one of the final sections of the article as well. Here is what questioning as a pre-reading strategy looks like. Before my students and I even dive into the text, we take about five minutes, maybe even less, to form some questions about the title and the headings. Again, this is to help us get interested, into the, interested in the text, um, figuring out what we want to know or what the author might be trying to educate us about. So a couple of questions here. Why did this person, this writer, go to prison? What crime did he commit? What kind of professor is he? And would I trust him to educate me? A couple more examples. For the next heading, what kind of crimes are most common? Why is the U.S. the highest? Why do we have the highest incarceration rates? Looking at the next heading, what led the author to crime? Was he influenced by, influenced by someone? Why is he sharing this story? I like that that question starts to get at his purpose for writing, his rhetorical situation, perhaps. And finally, what exactly does transformative mean? And how does education help with criminal backgrounds? 
What I like about this first question on this heading is that it is just a question about what a word means. Often students are afraid to admit when they don't know what a word means. I like to model for them and show them it's okay to not know the meaning of a word. And by asking this question, they are reminding themselves to then go back and look for the definition or to try to understand how the author is using that word in the context of the article. So what you see from these simple examples is that who, what, when, where, why, and how questions lead students to look for very specific information once they do move into the second stage of their reading process, the active reading. These questions lead students to look for evidence the author provides, logical reasons, or maybe even identifying faulty logic in the author's argument, examples and comparisons that might be used, they also encourage students to form personal opinions or connections to the text, and of course, helping them figure out the meaning of terms. Here's an example of some of my own students' pre-reading questions about an article called The Busy Trap by Tim Creter that's published in the New York Times. Again, these are students' questions about the text before they've even taken a dive into the full text. So they've skimmed and they've formed these questions. You can take a minute to pause the video if you'd like to read the questions closely. But what I was excited to see is that my students were already asking questions about the author's intentions, his purpose, the types of evidence he would or wouldn't provide. And they're also starting to ask questions about solutions to a potential problem the author addresses in the text. And again, these are the questions students are asking before even reading a text fully. So they're primed to be engaged in the text and to want to know more and to find answers to their questions. And they led to really wonderful discussions in our next class session as well. So when can you use pre-reading in your class? I think there's a lot of ways to use it, but one of my favorite, favorite ways is to use pre-reading at the end of a class session when you're telling students homework for the next class. So if you have an assignment that you want students to read for the next class, actually start that process in class. Have them open up to that article, that textbook chapter, whatever it might be, and take five minutes to form pre-reading questions before they leave the classroom. They can do this individually, they can do it with you, or they could do it with a partner or a small group. So now students would have already started the reading process. They've already completed the first step and they're primed and, and interested and ready to continue that reading process at home. You could also ask students to complete the pre-reading at home and to post their top three questions in a discussion board post. This could work very well for face-to-face -face courses and of course, online classes where students might not meet face-to-face, -face, but they could respond and write to each other's questions. Now let's talk about the second stage of the reading process, which is active reading. Again, there are many different types of active reading strategies. Sometimes students find uh, visualizing and drawing images of what they read to be a really great tool for recall later. Sometimes students will use the strikeout method for comprehending information, um, striking out information that actually seems irrelevant to their purpose for reading. And there's so much more, but what we're going to look at now is a very specific method for annotating that helps students monitor comprehension and to make information more memory, memorable for recall later in, in the class. Let's actually look at an example of an annotation. So here's an article called The Millennial Generation Lacks a Strong Work Ethic. And I used to use this article in class and I'd ask students to annotate it. Students would come to class and I'd say, let me see your annotations, and they'd very often look like this. But this is actually not a good annotation of a text, and you probably know why. You see pink highlighting, but almost more sentences, there are more sentences in pink than there are just plain text, no highlighting at all. So how is this annotation useful? And the truth is, it's not. Uh, how does this help um, identify key pieces of information that the student could recall and use in a class discussion later. It would be pretty challenging. So this, I would say, is an ineffective annotation of a text, but this is 
pretty often what we see students show up with in class when they have read and so-called annotated the text. Here's one more example. This one's quite different. While there's no highlighting, there is some circling and there are a couple notes in the margins, which is good. I definitely encourage students to take notes in the margins. But the circling, what does this mean? Students have probably been told to circle information, but what's the purpose of that? The meaning behind that? Likely, the student was circling unfamiliar words, but we don't see any definitions written down or recorded. So again, recalling that information later is not going to be um, so easy when asked to use those terms for whatever the assignment is in class. So what I'm trying to explain is that students annotate but they often don't attach meaning to very specific annotation strategies and their annotations can take them any number of ways and sometimes not in the direction we want them to go for um, demonstrating their learning on an assignment. I encourage faculty in all disciplines to use an annotation key like this, where the strategy is listed on the left side and the purpose of that strategy is identified on the right side. Now there's actually seven annotation strategies I'm going to show you, but I often start the semester by asking students to focus on the first four because they're the most essential and most basic strategies. For highlighting, I want students to use that only to identify a paragraph's main idea. And it doesn't even have to be used in every paragraph, but generally highlighting, I like my students to do um, one to two sentences tops in a paragraph with highlighting, and then I ask them to put the highlighter down. Then they can use underlining as ways to identify examples or evidence in that paragraph or that section that supports the main idea. So underlining is used for identifying examples and evidence. Again, circling and of course then defining unfamiliar words is essential to students' comprehension. If a student does not understand the meaning of a word, or they think a word has a meaning that it in fact does not, can really skew their understanding of the writer's message or the content they need to learn for their courses. And then the fourth annotation strategy is to put boxes around words that indicate an author's tone or attitude about a topic. Tone can be either neutral or biased. Bias does not necessarily mean wrong, um, but it's opinionated. Students have a really hard time, especially in writing, picking up on tone. And again, an author's tone can help reveal the purpose and the message of a, a text. So it's very important that students practice identifying those tone words. When you feel your students are ready or when you think it applies to a particular reading assignment you've given your students, you could start to ask them to use um, steps five, six, and seven. Double underlining can be used when an author, when a reader, the student, sees a shift or contrast in the author's ideas, where an author's ideas kind of have a caveat, or they're going with, but, yet, however, on the other hand. It's very important for students to be able to distinguish these types of moves in a text to aid in their comprehension. Using a zigzag line can be really helpful when students need to identify sentences or phrases that indicate when an author summarizes someone else's view. A lot of the scholarly work we ask our students to read includes an author not only presenting their own view of a topic, but summarizing, paraphrasing, or addressing the other viewpoint or the naysayer viewpoint. Students very much struggle with differentiating between a, a writer or an author's view and then the views of the sources they use. And we need to help them realize that they struggle with that. And once they can do that uh, much better, they're able to comprehend the information and to write about it later or to answer those exam questions on the test, whatever their task is. And finally, the brackets can be used for students when they find something especially interesting or questionable Emphasize it's okay to ask questions or to not understand something they've read so that they can come back to class and get help from you and their classmates. So let's look at a couple of examples of my students' annotations after I gave them a copy of my annotation key that I just reviewed, had them keep it with them while they read, and then use it on the text. These two examples are so 
much better than the original examples I showed you where the page was all pink or just some circling. Because what this is here is a resource for students to use in class. So in class, when I say, what is the author's main point or what are the author's main reasons? My students can go straight to the highlighting. When I say, where does the author provide evidence or an example of that, my students can look at just their underlying sections and very quickly pick out that information to recall and to share and to use in class discussion or in their essays. I always advise faculty to design discussion questions that relate to the types of annotations you ask your students to do to help them see the usefulness in those annotation strategies. So when can we practice active reading? Again, I think it's great to do this before a class session ends for you to model the active reading stage or maybe a couple paragraphs of the text you want students to read. It's really important for them to see how a scholar in their discipline reads, decides what's important or what's not. It's also very important for them to see how much time it takes to read well and to annotate effectively. You can also use annotations as attendance, have students show their annotations as they walk in the door, or submit images of their annotations in Blackboard. You can also tell students that they will compare their own annotations to yours to show that you also annotate before discussing a text in class, and students love to compare their work to their faculty members' work. And then you can also provide post-reading or discussion questions ahead of time so that students have those in mind and they can annotate um, related to those questions. Here are some quick results on applying the reading process in my own class. Prior to integrating reading instruction, kind of explicit reading instruction into my course, the class average on my student's first essay was around 72%. And I wasn't very happy with that because truthfully, it's barely passing and I knew my students could do better. After integrating reading instruction into my course, the class average on that first same essay, same text, same instructions, jumped to around 84%. I was so pleased with these essays because I could see my students summarizing accurately, paraphrasing accurately, um, and really responding to the main points of an article in truly thoughtful ways. So for me, the reading process, the reading instruction is, has had a huge payoff in my students' learning. What I want everyone to remember is that reading instruction should be taught early, frequent, and fast. And I picked up what I'm about to say from a text called Help, My College Students Can't Read. And the author suggests early, frequent, and fast reading instruction. She says, begin as early in the semester as you can. The sooner you get students started, the sooner their reading comprehension will improve. Work in teaching reading strategies as frequently as you can. Repetition will strengthen and cement students' skills. The more often you focus students on learning to be effective readers, the more they will see it as important. And finally, reading lessons should also be fast. It is well known that teaching new information in short bursts over a period of time is more effective than teaching it in one or two long sessions. Likewise, it is better to teach reading strategies several times during the semester for just 10 minutes than to teach it once or twice for hours at a time. I love how simple she makes it sound and that it does not have to take time away from the content you truly need to teach. So early, frequent, and fast reading instruction will prove to be very beneficial for your students, especially if all faculty in all disciplines are using and teaching the same strategies. So some reflection, what have you observed about your students' reading abilities? What are some of the problems or issues you see in class that you believe are connected to reading skills? If you want to discuss those questions, those concerns, or any other reading and writing needs you think your students have, please contact me. I'm always happy to set up one-on-one -on -one consultations to discuss this material further.